Hey everyone, welcome back to the I Heart Podcast. My name is Jonathan North, and today's show is another kind of experimental episode, just playing around with different formats and finding new ways to talk about movies and entertainment. Today I'm joined by my friend Eli Sanza, and we're going to be choosing our favorite movies, TV shows, actors, and actresses from 2018 in a wide variety of categories. We'll be talking about some of our favorites and recognizing some lesser known titles that may not be getting the attention that we think they deserve. I decided to call this episode the We Heart Awards, mostly because I wanted to stay on brand, but also because the week before we recorded this, I saw that the radio station, iHeartRadio, had their own I Heart Awards, and even though they spell theirs slightly differently, I figured I'd still change mine. Plus, I have Eli with me, we're both giving out these awards, so I thought calling these the We Heart Awards definitely still works. This show is partly inspired by regular award ceremonies, such as the Oscars or the Emmys, but kind of only in the fact that these shows never seem to give the right movies the best awards. And by that I mean, the movies that I want to win never seem to win. Except this year, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse somehow won the Oscar for Best Animated Picture, and I really didn't think that was going to happen. But then again, I thought it was worthy of at least a Best Picture nomination, just based on its innovation alone, and it didn't get that, so you win some, you lose some. Having said all that, I thought it would be fun to do my own award show, but only focus on the awards that people care about. Like, I can appreciate the sound mixing and makeup in a movie, but I'm really invested in who wins these categories. However, I'm always interested in who wins Best Picture, or at least the best animated feature, because, well, you know me. So for this podcast, I thought we'd narrow down the list of categories significantly and then just make up a bunch of our own. Because in most award shows, there's really only a certain kind of movie that wins the best pictures, and that's drama. You have outlier situations here and there, but the vast majority of award show winners are dramas. So I thought it was high time that some other kinds of movies at least get a mention. So for my show, I wanted to have a segment specifically dedicated to the variety of different genres there are and recognizing the best films or TV shows in their respective categories. And then as I tend to do, I went way overboard. I just started making up random awards right and left, and I ultimately ended up with somewhere between 50 and 60 categories, which, as much as I like talking about my favorite things, that's even overkill for me. So I started pruning things, combining categories, but in the end I still had around 40, and I decided to just go with it. I figured if we ran long I could split it into a two-parter. And then we talked for three hours. <laughs> so of course I'm going to edit that down significantly, but there was still so much content that there was no way I could release it as one. So I split the show into two episodes, both with the same idea, but each episode is going to look at things in entirely different ways. In the first episode, we're focusing on the basic award show awards, the best actors, actresses, movies, TV shows, as well as our picks for the best title within each genre. The format of the next episode is where I got a lot more experimental, but I'll explain more of that when we get there. Before we begin, I just wanted to apologize for the occasional dips in audio quality. Recording over the internet can be a challenge at times, and the night we recorded this was one of those times. The issues will probably be more noticeable in the video version, which you'll find on YouTube, but for the most part, I think I've been able to clean it up. Hopefully the minor issues that remain in the episode won't be too distracting, but either way, let's just get on with the We Heart Awards with Eli Sanza. So we'll start off right. with the best artist award. I, I say artist and most of it is actors, actresses, but we also have best director in there. We'll start with the best actor yeah. and or actress. And you could do as many as you wanted. I have two, but I was thinking like we're doing TV and movies together. So if you want to do one, one of each for both TV and movie. So who do you have for your yeah, yeah. actor, actress for whatever medium? Okay, for best actor, I chose the actor from a TV show called Cobra Kai, which is on YouTube Premium, and his name is William Zapka. He was the man who played Johnny Lawrence, the main rival in the Karate Kid movies. And Cobra Kai is the reboot of the Karate Kid movie in serial form, and it centers around this character and not on Ralph Macchio's character. The act, it's, it's a show about the villain from the Karate Kid and it takes place hmm. um, 34 years after the Karate Kid. And I thought that this actor, William Zabka, was really outstanding in the role of Johnny Lawrence 34 years later because he, he's kind of like this down and out loser who's 
struggling to get by in life ever since he lost that big karate tournament years ago and gets into fights now with like teenage street gangs and like and is kind of like a low life but he tries to find a purpose in life again and tries to reopen the cobra kai dojo and i thought that he conveyed the angst that was necessary for that role really well and he was someone who i didn't even pay attention to that much as an actor but he sort of surprised me here and i thought he was really outstanding yeah i've heard of the show but i've never seen it that's interesting i didn't know it was about the villain yeah you might want to check it out was that the only person you had in that category or did you have more I didn't go with more than one for most of these categories. I had mostly just chosen one. Well, I have two. There were two that came to mind right away when I was thinking about this category. One from movies and one from TV. So from movies, I have Emily Blunt, who played both Mary Poppins in Mary Poppins Returns and Evelyn Abbott in A Quiet Place, which are two completely different movies, but yeah. did such a great job in both of those roles, playing the no-nonsense nanny and then the mother who's trying to keep her children safe in the end of the world when this yeah. these monsters are attacking. I, I just thought she was amazing, and I thought that she deserved to be the best actress. A good choice. Good choice, because Emily Blunt is really uh, versatile. Mm -hmm. And then in TV, I chose Neil Patrick Harris, who played Count Olaf in A Series of Unfortunate Events. He's done this for three seasons, so you can think of it as this is from the last season or this season. I think this season was 2019, but either way, in every episode, he plays the same character, but in a completely different way, because he's in disguise and it's usually ridiculous but hilarious and he pulls off this character so perfectly i wasn't a huge fan of the original movie but jim carrey was great as count olaf and i didn't know how anybody was going to be able to top that but neil patrick harris he, he is count olaf now he he just embodies that character so well i thought he was perfect and i had to give him the best actor yeah, no, uh, you're talking to someone who is a big fan of series of unfortunate events, and I loved the character Count Olaf, and I loved the way that Neil Patrick Harris played him. That's, that's another very good choice, and I also wasn't that much a fan of the movie, but I do like Jim Carrey, and I thought that those were big shoes to fill that mm -hmm. Neil Patrick Harris succeeded at filling. Yeah. Okay, the next category is the best voice actor or actress. This one was very tough for me because I, was, I, I couldn't really figure out how to choose one person for this role, but I mm -hmm. did, if you don't mind me doing this, I, I did pick something, but it was uh, an, an ensemble voice cast instead of just one person in particular. Okay, that's fine. What I ended up choosing was the voice cast from Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Oh, okay. I thought this was really good. Mike Morales, voiced by Shamik Moore. He was particularly pretty outstanding because he was the lead, so he had to be like the best person in the cast just for the responsibility of being the lead actor. But everybody did a really fantastic job. Like um, a lot of people who I was wasn't expecting to be in this movie like Nicolas Cage and Don Mulaney <laughs> were, were funny really funny and Brian what's his name Brian Tyree Henry as Miles Morales' dad was also he did a really good job of, of conveying emotion mm -hmm. and and I and especially Jake Johnson as Peter B. Parker was <laughs> really like he might actually be my favorite in the entire movie but he is just really hilarious, but I, I think my choice for best voice acting goes to that entire movie. Yeah, I can't disagree. I think that they're great. For mine, I think maybe I'll change mine because if, you, if you're if you doing like the whole cast, I'm going to do the whole cast of a show because oh, okay. when I was trying to pick mine, I was having a very hard time picking just one. So I'll just go with the cast of Steven Universe because oh, okay. th this is like 
basically my favorite animated show right now. It's so good, and the cast is so good. Originally, I picked just Dee Dee Magno Hall because I just think her as Pearl. She's so good, but everybody in the show is good. Zach Callison as Steven, I don't know, there's something about him that he plays the little kid who's both innocent and tough at the same time really well. Estelle as Garnet, she's great. She she and Dee Dee Magno Hall are like, I don't know, they hold the show together. They're just so perfect. But of course, Michaela Dietz is Amethyst. I love her too. Everybody in that show is great. Tom Sharpling is Greg. Then you have like the side cast too. Shelby Ramirez, Peridot, Jennifer Paz as Lapis Lazuli. Just Mm -hmm. everybody, everybody in the show is great. And I think they all deserve awards. I don't, I don't know if the show has gotten voice awards, but if they haven't, they need to. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad I inspired you to uh, put a spotlight on the entire cast of that show because they really are out- outstanding. Mm-hmm. The next category is not one that, like, I don't think there's a category in award shows for this, but I thought it would be fun to talk about the best child actor or actress. Yes, okay. I went with Elsie Fisher for this one. She is... 15 years old, but she did a really good job in the movie Eighth Grade. As a girl who is sort of lacks confidence and is more comfortable being on social media than talking to people in real life, I thought she portrayed that kind of character really well and really realistically. She is also what portrays shyness really well. And it seems like the kind of people who would post on social media are usually shy people so I thought that was really well done and the way that her character sort of like grew up in that movie within the time frame of that movie as as somebody who was just like posting things on social media in order to help people and then by the time the movie ends she realized that (laughs) nothing she says make made sense to to teach people because she wasn't even following her own advice. She underplayed it so subtly. What her mentality going through that roller coaster of being a teenager, it wasn't overacted. She, she is just, she did a good job of acting the way that a teenager, probably a, a, someone who's shy and not extroverted, would actually act like in that mm-hmm. situation. So I think she is the best child actor of 2018 yeah i never saw that movie i saw interviews with her about it and i thought the movie looked interesting but i just never got a chance to see it for mine i chose two again one from a movie and one from an animated tv show so this is kind of related to voice acting too my first choice was from a movie i chose millicent simmons who played reagan abbott in a quiet place this is a deaf actress and the character is also deaf in the movie i just thought she was perfect she was so good and the fact that they incorporated her deafness into the character or i think their character was written to be deaf because that's an important plot point because of the way the story of the movie goes i just thought she was perfectly cast i thought she was great and then i also chose bella ramsey who played hilda in the new netflix animated series hilda like good choice. All, all the kids in that show are great, but there's just something about her voice. I just loved the voice choice that they went with. I loved her. I thought she was so good. Just like I was saying with the my choice, he he underplayed that role. Mm-hmm. I don't watch Game of Thrones, but I've seen some clips of her playing a character in Game of Thrones, so I can tell that she's not just a good voice actress. She's also a great actress. Period. And it'll be interesting to see what else she does as she grows up. Oh, yeah. As, as somebody who is a fan of Game of Thrones, I know exactly who you're talking about. And, and I feel the same way you do. So the next category is the best guest or supporting actor or actress. This I was thinking of both in terms of TV and movies. So, like, I was thinking, like, if a TV show had a character come on for one episode... Or if there's somebody who's not quite the main character in the movie, I thought this was a way to give them a moment in the spotlight. Okay, that's that's a good idea. Like, I was struggling with this. I was like, oh, there are so many guest mm-hmm. actors on TV that I could have shown. But if it was between the guest actor on TV or a supporting actor in a movie, I had to go with a supporting actor in a movie because I had to go with Aquafina 
in Crazy Rich Asians. Oh. That's my choice for Best Supporting Actress. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I I thought he was hilarious in that movie. He was like the, the, the breakout star of that movie, enlivened every scene as Rachel uh-huh. Chu's best friend. And I didn't even know who Aquafina was when mm-hmm. I when I first saw this movie, but I became a fan of her uh, after seeing it. And now she's one of my favorite comedians. I didn't see Ocean's Eight. I know she's in that, but after Crazy Rich Asians, I am an Aquafina fan. That, that's how much of an impression she made on me in that movie. She was so funny in that film. Yeah, that's a great choice. I I didn't think of her for this category, but she's mentioned later in my list. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I can't wait to see what you say about her. <laughs> for this category, I went with Letitia Wright as Shuri in Black Panther and Avengers uh-huh. Infinity War. She's, oh, I love her. She's basically one of my favorite characters in the MCU now. I loved her. She's like my favorite character from Black Panther. Even though she wasn't like the main character, I wanted her to get a mention somewhere. I'm hoping that one of these days they'll find a way to give her her own movie because she she deserves a, a moment to be the star. You know, I never thought about that, but she could hold her own movie. That character was so strong. I didn't think about this, but she is actually probably one of my favorite uh, supporting actors, too. I, I I also talk about her later on in this podcast. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. she was a really good choice for, for Best Supporting Actress. Okay. And then we have Best Director. Uh, okay. Best Director. Okay. This one... I am going to go with a director named Ari Aster. And this was the guy who directed the movie Hereditary. He knew how to direct it in the most scary way possible. He didn't hold back on making that as terrifying as possible. So if, just to put a spotlight on Ari Aster in particular, he was really good at creating payoffs through anticipation, like he's not afraid to slow down the movie so that when something shocking happens, it is even more surprising. It's like slow, 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 boom, something scary happens. It's, it's, there is a particular moment, like early on in the film when he does this, and it hooked me through the rest of the film. And mm. it was really skillfully done. And horror movies are not my favorite. But when they're directed well, they're like some of the best films out there. And I thought he was really deserving of this award as best director of the year. Okay. Yeah, I never saw that one. I don't see that many horror movies. Like, I don't really make it a point to go to any horror movies. The only mm. one that I went to see this year was A Quiet Place. And that was because it was more of a thriller, I thought, than a horror movie. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I heard I heard about Hereditary a lot. Like I heard people praising it everywhere. So I have been kind of curious, yeah. but like not curious enough to like to go go and seek it out, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well if you do decide to watch it, get ready because it is rated R and it's pretty gruesome. Yeah, that's why I don't really like horror movies. I'm not a fan yeah. <laughs> of being gruesome. Okay, so for my best director, I have three, but they're all from the same movie. I chose, and I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Bob Persichetti, Peter Ramsey, and Rodney Rothman from Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. That movie was just Mm. phenomenal on every level, and the directing was part of the reason why. It was amazing. The movie looked amazing. Every choice that they made was amazing. And I thought that they deserved it even more than like live action directors. They just, they knocked it out of the park. It was so good. Yeah, that that's a good choice because animated films are a lot harder to make than live action movies. So uh, they, and, and that's sometimes why, a lot of the times why more than one director make animated films a lot of the time because they require so much work. And the fact that this movie had like three directors that might have been, it might be a simplistic way of looking at it, but it might have something to do with why it turned out so well because those three directors, apparently they work really well together. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, they well, they did in this case. I I thought it was yeah. amazing. So then we're moving on to, I guess we could call it the best title awards or the best TV and movie, like the best TV show, the best movie. Oh, this is going to be the big one. Yeah. So the first couple here, they could have been in two different categories. I originally had them in two different categories each, but then I was having trouble really picking ones that fit into both. So I just combined them. So this is the best new and or returning TV series. Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to go with a show that is new that came out last year that I was my favorite new show of the year. And that was a show called Homecoming, which was a psychological thriller that was released on Amazon Prime Video. And it was based on a podcast. And it was uh, directed by Sam Ismail, which is the guy who created Mr. Robot. It was basically Julia Roberts played somebody named Heidi Bergman. She was a former caseworker at a support center for soldiers who wanted to transition back to civilian life after they fought in war. The facility that she worked at is very mysterious. Not, nobody really knows the purpose of the place or why exactly they want these soldiers to have a normal life again because it's not exactly what people think it is. It's like they don't just want them to have a normal life uh, so that they can um, integrate into society. They're doing it for a specific reason. And a U.S. Department of Defense auditor, like, interview of Julia Roberts years after she worked there to try to find out the mystery of this place and she realizes that he doesn't even know the purpose of the place and, and, she, and she's being very secretive about it it's basically it's just a really captivating mystery so it's like very mysterious and that was kind of the reason why I got drawn into it it was the show that I was hooked on the most of all the new shows that came out last year it was the one that I got hooked on the most Interesting. I don't think I've heard of that one. It's not really uh, one that a lot of people were talking about, but it, but the people who have seen it really loved it. Hmm. Well, for mine, I had trouble picking mine because I watch I I, pro, I watch more TV than movies, so I was trying to pick one that like encompassed everything I love about TV. I think I'm gonna go with The Good Place because that show it's just so different. It's it's sold as a sitcom, but there's just so much more going on to it than just the basic sitcom. And I don't want to go into the plot yeah. too much in case somebody hasn't seen it, but <laughs> the basic yeah. premise of the first part of the show, like the first episodes is that this woman has died and woken up in the good place. The, it's basically heaven. There's a good place and a bad place. They're called the good place and the bad place. But she quickly yeah. realizes that she is not who they think she is. There's been some kind of a mix-up and two people with the same name were sent to the wrong place. So she was supposed to be in the bad place and there's someone with her same name who went there in her place. This is not the only thing that's going on. There's a lot more. Like, it seems like every few episodes some new grand revelation happens and you find out more about what's actually going on. But for the purpose of this, so I don't spoil anything, basically she's just trying to keep her head down and stay out of trouble. The acting, the writing, everything about this show is so good. I just, I love the characters. I love how it hooks you with the ongoing plot. It's all serialized, and I love serialized television. It's just such a good show. It's probably my favorite series of the last year, even though I have a bunch that I like. This is the one that every time there was a new episode out, I instantly watched as soon as it hit Hulu because I couldn't wait. I, I had to see this one. Like there's other shows that I really like that I'll wait until I have like three backed up and then I'll watch all three. This is like, I can't wait. I've got to watch every episode that comes out. Yeah. Oh yeah. I saw the first season of this show and I saw the twist at the end of season one. And it really elevated it above most other comedies that are on mm -hmm. uh, broadcast television. I think, I think The Good Place might actually be my favorite show if you don't include the streaming or cable 
um, last year, and because I also really love it. It's 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 a lot more creative than the average sitcom, and, I, and that kind of stuff really excites me because I am tired of seeing the same old thing, and and this show is really surreal and mm-hmm. really unpredictable, and yeah. I and I think I love it just as much as you do. Yeah, it's so strange and beautiful at the same time in some places. It's just, it's so different. And I love that it's so different. Like, there's no other show like it that I can think of right now. It's just so good. Yeah, I can't think of any other show like it either. So the next category is the same as that one, but for animated. So the best new and or returning animated TV series. Okay, for the best new animated series i just have to go with hilda i did the I, same I, thing. I we have the same that, one <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i i had a feeling i nothing could compete with hilda i thought it was it was just it was a great fantasy series for kids it didn't have juvenile humor or anything no gross out mm-hmm. humor that's the kind of thing that I get tired of because every show is like that. This was a little bit more gentle and a little bit more sophisticated, mm-hmm. but, it, but it also had a really likable cast and, mm-hmm. and really good lessons, I thought. And it was, it, it was really well done. Yeah. And again, it's a show that I can't really think of another show like it. It's just so different from any in its genre. The main characters, they're nicer than a lot of main characters in kids' shows. It's just, it's quiet, and I like how quiet it is, but it also has the mystery and the supernatural creatures like the giants and the elves and everything, but it's all done in such a way that is completely different from anything else like it. I just love the overall feeling of the show, the music, the art, everything. It's so good. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you. Then the next category, I ended up combining, like I had this separated out as live action and animated, but I ended up combining it because I didn't see that many short films as the best short film category. So if you have like live action and animated, you can go ahead and separate them. But I ended up just combining it because I could really only think of a couple that I'd actually seen. Okay, so, I, well, uh, for this one, I decided to just focus on one because there was one short film in 2018 that was, like, more outstanding than anything I've ever seen. And it's, and it's kind of a weird choice, but I just decided, yeah, what the heck, I'm going to go with it. It's, 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 if you've ever seen the 1942 uh, Mary Melodies cartoon directed by Chuck Jones called The Dover Boy, then you might have also heard of the 2018 version of that cartoon that was reanimated by 90 different animators who had completely different animation styles and they each got a scene from that cartoon. It's the exact same audio from the cartoon. The only thing that's different is how it looks and it's a bunch of different art styles and it was done by a bunch of different people but it was arranged by an animator named Zurel. Spelled Z E U R E L. That guy is on YouTube and he's on Twitter. And I thought that <laughs> it was a really a funny remake of that cartoon. I th- I think I laughed harder at this reanimated version of the Dover Boys than I did at the actual Dover Boys cartoon. Hmm. And the main reason why I chose it is just because I it's one of the things that made me laugh harder than anything I've ever seen in the entire year. I don't think I've heard of that one at all. I don't think I've even heard of the original short film. Is this something that was released on TV in theaters or was it just like a web cartoon? Oh, this was just a web cartoon. It wasn't in theaters at all. It was just like it was just like some little project that these animators who were just fans of the cartoon thought, hey, let's try this. We're such fans of this cartoon. I just want to see what it looks like if we just animate, reanimate every single scene. And they just released it on YouTube hmm. just for the fun of it. And it shows when you watch it that it was all just for the fun of it because it's really wacky and really fun to watch. And it, like, I would recommend watching the the Dover Boys cartoon uh, first, because I think that is in the public domain, so I think it's available on YouTube. Okay. But as soon as you watch that, then watch this new version of it. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to look it up. I, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, it's really funny. 
So for my best short film, I was originally thinking I was just going to end up going with Bow, which is Pixar's short film, because it was really good. But then yeah. the other day, I realized I had actually not yet watched the short that was packaged with Incredibles 2 on the DVD, Auntie Edna. And I watched that. It was like instantly my favorite short. It was so hilarious. Oh, <laughs> I really? I really love Edna. But seeing her interact with baby Jack-Jack, her reactions or lack of reactions to everything he was doing, just the way it was animated, everything about that short was hilarious comedy gold. I had to go with that one my favorite. It was really good. Bao is really good in its own way, but this one, it just made me laugh through the whole thing. It was so good. I loved it. Never seen that uh, Auntie Edna short yet because I didn't watch The Incredibles, um, Incredibles 2. I, I, I think that one might not be on The Incredibles 2 DVD. I think it might be just on the Blu-ray because I watched The Incredibles 2 DVD, but I don't think I saw that short. But you're selling me on it. I kind of want to see it now because if it made you laugh, maybe I'll like it a lot too. It was really good. So the next two categories are ones that people, if they've seen either of the podcasts I've done with Soul or Rachel, they're going to know. So we have the best animated film and the best film. So people already know mine. I'll say them again when you say yours, but it's I, they, okay. they need to be included even though people already know mine because they're yeah, okay. the biggest things <laughs> of the year. So the best animated film in your opinion, which you'll probably agree with me. I'd be guessing I'll probably agree with you. I think we all know it's Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yes. It's my choice. Yes. For best animated film. And that was your choice, I'm assuming. Yes, yes, it was. I said earlier that the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse it was the most radical thing to happen to animation since Yellow Submarine in 1968. And it was a nice reminder that there was more to animated films than just Disney and Pixar style because it was really different from a movie that Disney and Pixar would make. It felt like Disney movies feel like symphonic or orchestras and this one felt a little bit more like rock and roll. And I thought that was really a revolutionary um, step forward in, in how people look at animation. CGI animation in particular, because nobody's tried anything new in a long time with CGI. Yeah, that's true. And this was really good looking. It was so wild and so bold in its mm -hmm. style choices. Yeah. Most of the time people are like, they talk about movies like if they do something, they're like, I hope other movies don't start copying them now. But I hope people start copying Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. I hope they copy it too. It's just the choices that they made were so new that I want to see how other people would incorporate those kind of things. I want to see people experiment more too. I want to see even more radical ideas than the ones they used in Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, to be honest. Yes. So then we have the best film, the best movie overall of the entire year. Mine was also Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So that I'm going with as best film of the year. And the reason why I think that it is the best film of the year is because all the things about this movie that make it amazing, like about, like about how original it is with its animation style and the fact that the race of the main character is like a black kid, which is something you don't normally see in like big sci-fi films, which has been pointed out earlier when we talked about Black Panther. And it's sort of still in the conversation when you see movies like this. All that stuff is great, but the most important thing about a movie is how much you connect to it emotionally. And I thought this was a really emotional film and I thought it was also really funny when it tried to be funny. It was really hilarious. Really funny script and a really emotional script and it did everything that I thought a film is supposed to do. And it succeeded at that more than the other movies that came out in that year, which is why I think that it is the best of the entire year. I basically had three favorite movies this year and it was really hard for me to choose. Spider-Man and Spider-Verse was one. And I also loved Solo, a Star Wars story. I know a lot of people had their problems with it. I loved it. But then ultimately I chose to go with Mary Poppins Returns as my favorite film because I went into it with probably with such low expectations that it absolutely blew me away. It felt 
like movies felt when I was a kid. It felt like I was eight years old borrowing a movie from the library and watching a Disney movie for the first time. They captured Disney magic in a way that modern Disney movies haven't been able to. Like old school Disney magic, like from the 60s Disney magic. Like Disney today, I love their movies, but it has a a new kind of magic to it. This felt like when I was a kid watching the old classics. I don't know, I guess it affected me the most out of all the movies I watched, which is why I chose to go with it as my favorite film of last year. But Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse was an extremely close second because it was just innovative and entertaining in equal measures. It was it was so good. Yeah. So, yeah, I have to say that I agree with you on the low expectations I had for Mary Poppins Returns. And it similarly, it really blew me away. And, and I also liked it a lot more than I thought it would. And it was one of my favorite films of the year. They were probably in my like top 10 favorite films of last year. So, I, so I'm not surprised at all by it being your choice. It blew me away. Like the, the, for the, all the reasons that you say it did, it was like it, it felt like a little bit of a throwback yeah. to the way that they used to make Disney movies, which I thought was really cool. I, I like old Disney movies from the 60s. So the next section of awards, like when you watch the Oscars, there's only like a certain kind of movies that usually gets the awards as like the best movie. And it's usually drama. Mm -hmm. So the next section is the best in its genre. I think I have picked out all the genres. Maybe there's more that I've missed and somebody can let me know if I missed the genre. But I think I've got like 10 categories here. So we'll have the best of each kind of movie. The first in my list is the best comedy. Okay, this one was a very easy choice for me. I'm going to go with a movie called Blockers which was directed by Kay Cannon, the person who wrote Pitch Perfect. And it starred Leslie Mann, John Cena, and Ike Barinholtz as parents trying to find their daughters on prom night and stop them from having a good time with boys. And it was very similar to the kind of comedy that you see in like that Africa movies. It was not very kid-friendly at all, but if that kind of like r-rated humor like doesn't bother you it is really funny and it, and i cracked up laughing at it more than i did at than in, in any other movie because it was like this was just a hilarious concept in itself and and i also it wasn't just the fact that it was funny it was also the fact that it was like uh, it had a really good message that i thought felt in line with the times and it, it was the kind of thing that made it seem a little bit different than other kind of comedies that was similar okay yeah i never saw that one i didn't really see too many comedies this year and none that really stuck out to me as being worthy of an award of the best comedy so i decided to go with the tv show since we're still talking about tv too and i decided just to give the best comedy to the good place because it's hilarious and so well written i just i love it and i thought it deserved to be in this spot too since i couldn't think of a movie okay well there weren't that very many comedies that came out last year so i don't blame you like that's a good choice then the next category i have is best musical okay now i'm going to talk about mary poppins returns I because wonder. i thought that yeah <laughs> That movie was really amazing. It was really amazing for all the reasons that you just said. I agree with you. Mary Poppins Returns, really outstanding. I, I thought it was the perfect movie for a time like this because like in these dark times where everyone's mad at each other, sometimes a nice musical is what will cheer you up. And this, I thought, was really well done. It didn't seem like a, a cynical cash grab or anything like that. It felt like there was actual heart behind this film that I thought Rob Marshall did a really good job like directing this movie and making it seem like its own thing. It wasn't trying to copy Mary Poppins originally. It was it was it actually felt like a legitimate sequel and it justified its existence. 
and 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 I also really thought the songs were good because I didn't think anything could compete with the Sherman Brothers. But can you imagine that? Mm-hmm. And like a, a cover is not the book, and like trip a little light, fantastic, all really catchy songs. I really like that movie. That is my choice for best musical. Yeah, and I'm sure you can guess it's mine as well. Mm-hmm. For all the same reasons, like every like the whole movie felt like something from the '60s. But the music in particular, it just felt like Sherman Brothers songs, even though it wasn't, of course, but it just had that same feeling. It was just another instance of they somehow were able to capture the Disney magic from so many years ago and make it completely new. I just, I loved everything about that movie. Yeah, so good. It was so much better than I thought it would be. Okay, and then for this one, I've, I'm sure people will already guess mine by now since I've already mentioned it, but best horror movie. Okay, yeah, best horror movie. I already mentioned it too. I went with Hereditary. This movie, it was really disturbing, man. It was the, the most disturbing movie I've ever seen. It was like Tony Collette played the mom slash wife. Gabriel Byrne played her psychiatrist husband. They had a teenage son. They had a teenage daughter. It was like uh, the family was already kind of like a waspy, tense family. Then there's a death in the family that causes even more tension. And the tension slowly builds and builds and it gets worse. And it, and it keeps getting more tense and more terrifying until it gets to this like twist ending that explains why all this scary stuff is happening in the family. And like I said, the director was really good at building tension. And I thought it was just a really well-made, pure horror film. That's why I had to go with this as the best horror film of the year. Yeah, like I said, I haven't seen it. But for mine, and again, I don't watch many horror movies, so I went with A Quiet Place. I went to see this one. I don't know if I was really planning on it, but once I heard the premise and when I heard people were saying that they didn't really think of it as a horror movie because it wasn't like super gruesome and stuff, I was like, I could probably manage this one. So this one is about a family who is basically just trying to survive after some kind of unexplained alien invasion in which the aliens are all blind, but they hear extremely well. So basically the movie is super quiet through most of it because they're all trying to avoid being detected by the aliens because the aliens, if they hear something, like hear something loud, they'll like immediately attack. So it is imperative that you stay silent. And I just thought that they built tension so well. I just thought it was really creative. And the fact that it wasn't like disturbingly horrifying was enough for me to go see it. Because I'm I'm not into like being disturbed and disgusted when I'm watching movies. So if you don't like yeah. horror movies, but you like suspenseful things, I would definitely recommend A Quiet Place. Everybody's classifying it as horror, but I think it fits nicely into like a thriller genre. I, I really liked it. Yeah, I agree with you. And I actually thought that that movie was one of the most creative movies of the entire year. So I agree with you that on that. It was like very innovative and unlike anything I've ever seen. Uh, the concept of like having to stay quiet, it made the movie really suspenseful. Yeah, very suspenseful. Okay, the next category I have is the best sci-fi movie. Best sci-fi movie, I'm going to go with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse again. <laughs> okay. Because of this movie... Yeah, <laughs> this movie, interdimensional Spider-Man film, where multiple versions of the same superhero team up to defeat a crime boss. That is just it's just one of the coolest stories I've ever seen on film. Regardless of whether Spider-Man is the character, is the main character or not, it's just the fact that that concept of parallel dimensions is just really cool. I I can't not choose that as the best sci-fi film of the year for that alone yeah i I guess i can't disagree i i didn't even think of putting that one in this category because this is one of the few places i could actually mention this i wanted to give solo some something so Uh, i put put solo as my best (laughs) sci-fi film of the year um for anyone who doesn't know and i can't believe there'd be anyone who doesn't but just in case this is basically the origin story of han solo basically how he became 
the lovable scoundrel that he is today. It's him as a early 20s, maybe, growing up on this planet and escaping, <clears throat> getting the Millennium Falcon, meeting Lando Calrissian. I love this movie from beginning to end. It was not perfect. There were some things that I had slight issues with, but overall, it was one of my favorite movies of the year. Completely entertaining. I loved it. Yeah, I really loved it too. It was really good. And you learned how Han Solo met Chewbacca the Wookiee for the first time. That was my favorite part. <laughs> yeah, that was a great scene. Yeah, I don't know why people didn't like it. I heard that it was burnout out from The Last Jedi, but it was really good. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah, I loved it. So the next category, it's best fantasy. My choice for best fantasy was Paddington 2. I'm going to go with that one. That was pretty much the only choice because like I, there weren't a lot of fantasy films yeah, out that's there. What I was say. But as soon as I thought, oh, Paddington 2, that's a fantasy, a talking bear, having adventures. Yeah, I'm going to go with that because it's a good time to put the spotlight on that film because it, it deserves attention. It was amazing. Yeah, I, I couldn't really think of anything right off the top of my head, so I decided to go with another TV show and I just gave it to Hilda. <laughs> <laughs> good good choice yeah H hilda was just great like we've already talked about how great it is but for everything we mentioned yeah. before it was just one of the best fantasy things of the entire year i just loved it yeah you know what if i had thought to include tv i probably would have gone with hilda too actually <laughs> okay the next category is the best action okay Best action film, Mission Impossible Fallout, directed by Christopher McQuarrie, starring Tom Cruise. It was the best action film I thought of the year because it was the one with the most elaborate action and the most thrilling action. Like, and, which, and, and I thought all the Mission Impossible movies are getting better and better. And this one is my favorite of the entire series. Yeah, actually, that's my choice, too. And I don't really see that many just pure action films. Like, most of mo my favorite genre is science fiction. So most action films that I see are in the science fiction genre. And this one is not. I basically only went to see this one because my cousin Sasha really wanted to go. And I thought, eh, why not? So I went with her. And it just, every action set piece just blew me away with how incredible it was. And the fact that they did a lot of it, probably most of it, without CGI, just mind-blowing what they were able to pull off with just stunts. It was incredible. Yeah, it really was. Oh, thank God your cousin wanted to see that movie. You might never have given it a chance. <laughs> Probably not because I haven't seen all the Mission Impossible movies. I wasn't planning on going because I hadn't seen the other ones. Yeah. You don't have to see them all to understand what's going on. But uh, it just wasn't really on my list to see because of that. And I'm really glad that she wanted to go. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really good. Okay. So the next one is the best documentary. Very easy choice for me. I'm going with. Won't You Be My Neighbor? <laughs> yeah, I went with the same one. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. Are you like me? I, because I love Mr. Rogers. He is uh -huh. like one of my favorite people. Yeah, I, I grew up on Mr. Rogers, and I just love this movie, learning more about his life. A lot of it was kind of stuff that I already knew, but just the way it was presented, I just... I, I loved it. Yeah, I, this isn't even the first Mr. Rogers documentary I've seen. I've, I've seen others. This one, it was just a nice addition to the stuff that I already knew about him. But this one was the best one of all of the stuff I've seen about him before. Because every time I learn about this guy, I like him more and more. And he has the best message ever on like how to behave as a human being and how to treat other people and how one simple act of kindness can like change a person's life. All of that stuff is really like made this essential viewing. It was such a good movie because he was such a good person. Yeah, definitely. I didn't see really many documentaries this year, but I can pretty much guarantee that even if I'd seen every documentary that they made this year, this would still be at the top just because of, I don't know, childhood nostalgia for Mr. Rogers. 
it was really good. <laughs> yeah, that alone would do it, yeah. Okay, the next category is the best foreign language film. All right, okay, see, now this one, I'm going to go with a movie called Shoplifters. This movie was directed by someone named Hirokazu Koreeda. I probably mispronounced that, but that's just because I'm bad at pronouncing names. But this was about this Tokyo family of shoplifters living in poverty who find a, a girl who was abused by a family and they decide to take her in and they teach her how to shoplift too. So it's this like this Japanese family of criminals. They're not, they're not bad people. The only thing about their life that's terrible is that the fact that they're stealing. But other than that, they're like perfectly nice and civil to each other. And like, but it's a, it's a pretty like a dramatic film and it's kind of like a roller coaster of emotion because the family who owns that little girl that they adopt, they find out that she's gone and they try to get back. The whole thing was pretty emotional. And I'm like a sucker for like soap operas and, drama, and like heavy drama. So Shoplifters is my choice for best foreign language film. Yeah, I never saw that one, but Rachel Wagner was telling me about it. It was in her top 10 list when we did that podcast. She kind of described it as sort of an Oliver Twist kind of story with the way that the family operated with their stealing it sounded like one that i might enjoy so someday i probably will try and get around to watching that one that was a very good description all of a twist like rachel knew what she was talking about yeah well my best foreign language film is an animated film called mirai this is another one that people who've listened to my podcast have already heard me talk about this but it's such a good movie just to give a brief description in case somebody missed the other episodes it's basically this little four-year-old boy who has a new baby sister and he is a horrible brat he is visited by i guess you would say spirits like in a christmas story from the past present and future like his dog becomes a person mm. His little sister comes from the future as a teenage girl, and then he meets people from his family's history who all kind of, in their own way, teach him different lessons about being a better person. It's just so creative and beautiful. The animation is amazing. It's such a good movie. I highly recommend this movie to pretty much anybody. Okay, yeah, no, I first heard about this like uh, a while back and, and even more so after it got nominated for an Oscar. And I had no idea what this was about until just now when you told me. <laughs> and now I'm interested in watching it because it sounds interesting. But yeah, no, I, not, but I had no idea about this movie. And maybe I'll like it even more than Shoplifters, who knows? Yeah, it's really good. I highly recommend it. The next category we have is the best rom-com or romance film. I am going to go with Crazy Rich Asians for this yeah. category. Yeah, and me too. Yeah. This movie was probably my favorite rom-com of all time. I'm going to say it right here because, because I'm not usually a fan of romantic comedies. Even this one is a little bit formulaic when you think about it, but this took the rom-com formula and used it in like the best way, I thought. It was it, because the characters were all great and the romance in the movie, you got absorbed into the relationship between Rachel Chu and Nick Young, the two leads, and you were caught up in the family drama that was caused by Nick's mom not liking Rachel. But it was also really funny, too. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was really well done. Yeah, I thought about putting this as my favorite comedy, but I really wanted to have a different title for every category in this section. That's why I decided to go with The Good Place instead. But it basically was my favorite comedy movie of the year. It was so good. And I'm not really a rom-com fan. I don't dislike them. They're just not something that I want to watch all the time. I went to see this one basically just because I like Constance Wu. She's like the main, one of the main reasons that I love Fresh Off the Boat. She's just such a great actress. 
And I really wanted to see her in a different role than the mom on Fresh Off the Boat. And I'm really glad that she was cast as the lead in this film because I probably wouldn't have seen it otherwise and then I would have missed out. No, no, I like Constance Wu in Fresh Off the Boat, too. She's like my favorite character in that show. Mm-hmm. And so I agree with you there. It's surprising how much I like this because, I, because like I said, I don't normally see rom-coms. Like when I saw this movie in the theater, like everybody else in my work building was talking about how they saw The Meg. And I was the one person there who was talking <laughs> about Crazy Rich Asians. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw the Meg. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Uh, to this day, I still never seen it. But it, that's the, a movie about a giant shark. Seems like more like the kind of thing that I would watch. Well, yeah, me so, too. So <laughs> Crazy Rich Asians being the thing I was talking about. It was a little surprising. It felt a little toffee turvy, but I really liked it. So I'm glad I saw it. <clears throat> so the last category in the genre section is the best superhero, either movie or television show, whatever you want to do. I'm really behind on superhero television, so I decided to go with a movie, but whatever you want to do. Okay, well, I'm also kind of behind on the superhero shows, but it didn't matter because no matter what TV show I watched, I knew that I was going to choose a movie because my choice for best superhero film or television show of the year is again, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. And the reason why I chose that is because I thought it had great characters. I thought the movie was fun. It didn't take itself too seriously, which I prefer. I don't think any superhero film should take itself too seriously because superhero films are like, when you think about it, are kind of ridiculous. It's like no one actually goes around wearing capes. So the fact that it's like kind of a cartoony kind of goes with the vibe a little better. And and, and I, I even thought that Kingpin was a really good villain who had like good motivation because the only reason why he like opened those parallel universes is to find alternate versions of people who he lost in his own universe and so i thought not only were all the heroes great but i thought the villain was good too so i had to choose this even though i keep talking about this movie i I had to choose this for best superhero film or television show Mm -hmm. i think i'll just change my answer and agree with you because i originally wanted to have like something completely different for all these so i have incredible But really, Spider-Man in the Spider-Verse is better than Incredibles 2 in every way. So I can't <laughs> honestly give it to Incredibles 2. I have to give it to Spider-Man in the Spider-Verse because it was amazing. It was so good. It deserves to win in that category as well. Oh, yeah. I, I don't blame you for that because I loved Incredibles 2. It was pretty good. And oh, that yeah. was like, that would have been a good choice. Pretty much any other year, Incredibles 2 would have basically won it just, it happened to be outshone this year. <laughs> it just kept getting better toward the end of the year. Yeah, and, and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, if that movie didn't come out, you might have gone with Incredibles 2. I probably would have gone with Black Panther. Yeah, there was, yeah. There was quite a few this year, but Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, it really was the best. <laughs> it was incomparable. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning, this is just the first half of the show. In the next episode, I wanted to make sure we had a way to talk about things that otherwise wouldn't get a mention, so I just made up awards that I could fit more of my favorite things into. Like, I love the Pioneer Woman on Food Network, but she's unlikely to win an Emmy, so I thought, why not make up my own award to give her show? Same with the dubstep Kraken sequence in Hotel Transylvania 3. Nobody's gonna give that an Oscar for Best Original Song, but I feel like it deserves some kind of award. Random things like that. But like I said, I'll explain more when we get there. If you'd like more from Eli, I'll have a link to his blog as well as to his Twitter, and you'll be able to catch him right here in the next episode in the second half of the We Heart Awards. Thanks for watching. Thank you.